Hi, hello to all. It's an honor to be presenting at uh, the conference for this year. So a little bit about myself first. My name is Gerald Cho. I'm a final year linguistics and multilingual studies student at Nanyang Technological University uh, in Singapore. And I'm actually going to present some of the work that I've been doing for my bachelor's thesis, which has been to look at scripts of a form of theater known as Wayang Peranakan. Now these scripts are written and performed in Baba Malay, a contact language that is a hybrid of Malay and Hokkien, historically spoken by the Shrich Chinese or Chinese Peranakan. And Peranakan here is a poem which actually literally translates to child of the land. So Peranakan community in the Malay archipelago. Now I came into contact myself with Baba Malay studies because I'm actually of Chinese Peranakan descent on my grandmother's side. And I've been previously involved in attempts to revitalize the variety here in Singapore. Um, there are actually some organizations. Um, the main one, Unong Sayang Association, and they do things such as organize adult lessons to try to keep the language spreading um, because of the fact that obviously it's not used in a lot of households anymore due to language shift to English that will be discussed later on in the presentation. Um, and more importantly, obviously, like one of their initiatives is to hold a wine program annually. So yeah. Yeah, so once again, like Baum Malay basically combines influences from Malay and Hokkien. So the variety started out um, basically through the intermarriages of Chinese merchants and um, you know, Indonesian and Malay locals way back in the 15th and 16th centuries. Now, right now, you know, it's highly endangered. I mentioned before the language transmission to the younger generations is basically being cut off. So there are only about 2,000 speakers across the two remaining linguistic nuclei. One is Malacca uh, in Malaysia and one is Singapore. So when Peranakan, yeah, it's a form of traditional theater, but I think the interesting thing to note here is that like, unlike other forms of theater you might find in other oral cultures, for example, there isn't really a distinct dramatic register. Now that's because Wayang Peranakan aims to simulate everyday speech as much as possible. Because once again, its aim is to preserve the language within the community. So it needs to be something that when you watch, you can apply to in your daily conversations as well. Now this is something that is not unheard of. It's not special to Wayang Peranakan, of course. So some studies cited in the presentation are Kiza, sometimes in Kelly, in their studies, of um, uh, African Indigenous and uh, Australia Aboriginal Indigenous um, theater uh, practices, uh, respectively, also talk about how you know linguistic identities are usually codified right in this place. So what becomes accepted as canonical in the absence of a standardized um, thought, which you know most of these oral cultures, you know, just like Baba Malay, they don't have a uh, standard. Yeah. Now, moreover, in terms of research done on Singaporean Baba Malay, there is a research gap, right? Interviews with speakers have been done as recently as 2014 with Dr. Nala Hui Lee summarizing her findings in a contemporary grammar, but not much was study of the spoken or written language between 1989 and 2014. With most studies published during that period focused on older texts from the 18th, um, sorry, the 19th and earlier half of the 20th centuries. White Peranakan scripts, hence, are an overlooked trove of data. And given that a large proportion of the community still attend these days annually, the outreach is quite significant. What linguistic conventions there are are basically both reflected in and transmitted by these performances. Now, given that the play spent about two and a half decades, it might also be worth looking at trends in the language to see if there are any lexical and syntactic developments, so basically any dichronic changes. And to achieve this, a corpus based approach would actually be appropriate. And this indeed has been adopted by scholars of other languages. For example, the Icelandic past historical corpus was created with the purpose of investigating the stability and distribution of certain syntactic and morphological constructions. The corpus text spanned a variety of genres, from saga to legal documents, but as Baba Malay literature produced during the 1980s to present day is quite limited, it's best to really just focus studies on just the one here, the Wayang itself. Indeed, dedicated drama corpora are not a new thing either. With Skorinkin and team launching the Russian drama corpus project recently, the most interesting observation from their study was that given that characters inhibit, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, basically inhabit their own universe, they form social networks and take on social linguistic identities, which mirror those in real life. 
And this allows scholars to observe how language use differed according to demographic factors such as gender. Why Peranakan relies a lot on archetypes, as we'll see later, right? And their appearances from script is very consistent. So this is definitely an avenue to explore as well. So now onto the scripts which are currently in the corpus. Now what the original aim was to get a more representative sample of the different time periods, corporate ownership, given that place remain quite recent and not really available for public use usually, presented an issue. Some, however, are available to the public and I have transcribed though, um, you know, um, it's okay if it's, it's, it's for the purpose of research. So my plan has is to actually present these preliminary findings to the community, to people who actually you know, own the copyright to some of the scripts. And if they actually find the research useful, then um, I will then gain the permission to look at other scripts, which might still be under copyright law. Now, nevertheless, the corpus currently consists of slightly more than 40,000 words, which is admittedly quite a small one. But once again, this demonstrates the challenge of working with endangered language corpora, right? There isn't much literature available sometimes, so we basically have to work with um, what we have. But preliminary uh, studies, thankfully, have yielded some interesting results already. Uh, now this was done after running the corpus through some tests with the aid of Lawrence Anthony Hancock, um, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, which um, produces a whole host of useful information by generating word lists, showing the incidence of certain lexical items in one script relative to others, identifying collocations, so on. So I want to cover the question about how the plays may codify certain linguistic identities first. And one of the first tests I did was to separate the male and female speech into individual documents, and then use Ankong's keyword list function. Now, keyness, um, you know, uh, basically all your, your keywords basically are the ones that exhibit the most keyness. Now, keyness refers to the frequency of a word in a text when compared with its frequency in a reference corpus. So the higher the keyness, the more evidence to suggest a certain word may be preferred in a certain genre, if you're looking at genre comparisons, for example, or in this case, by a certain demographic. So a test was done to investigate whether some words were disproportionately used by more characters um, of a certain gender, but this did not actually yield any significant results, unlike what we saw with the Russian drug for example, previously. So another comparison I did was therefore between the speech of Bibic characters. Now, who are your Bibics? So Bibics are your stereotypical, you know, Iron Lady matriarchs. Okay? They're often in their 70s or 80s, and they're traditionally seen as the vanguards and icons of cultural and linguistic preservation within the community, very idiosyncratic way of speaking. So I did this, I compared Bibic speech, compared the speech of all other characters, which did, did actually um, yield some results. I want to point uh, particular attention to C. So that's the um, the first rank on the first picture, the top picture. Now, C is tagged onto words to produce a vocative sense, that is to make it a term of address. So you could uh, attach it to, for example, a um, adjective like gomok, which means fat. So C gomok, for example, would translate to the fat one and would be used as a galeran, which is, I think, um, would be translated as nickname um, for certain relatives. Although I will say, funnily enough, it might be used both literally and sardonically, like sarcastically, to refer to skinny people. So it doesn't really give any indication of the actual body type of the person they refer to, but that's a detail, right? So it will make more sense that this is found more in epic speech, given that it's not so common a practice nowadays. So this was an interesting result that, um, you know, lined up with what we know about um, certain social conventions in Baba Malay culture. Now, also of note is the genet uh, marker punia right that's number five also highlighted i'll discuss that later now in the second picture what is interesting is that english pronouns uh, which are uttered during moments in which characters engage in code switching which is a rather common practice as well are considered keywords in the speech of the younger characters and in terms of absolute numbers i didn't include them here but there's actually quite a difference now while bibic speech forms about a third so that's one third of the entire corpus non-bibic characters are 10 times more likely to feature English pronouns in their speech. And this is important for later when um, I will discuss the proportion of English used in the scripts. Now, it seems, however, that a more qualitative approach might be actually better at discovering how certain linguistic identities can be codified. One of the most obvious examples is how non-native Baba Malay speech 
um, produced by the archetypal servant characters who are usually of Chinese descent. Um, you know, they actually feature a lot of sound changes which seem to be very consistent across um, scripts. And a small list of rules can actually be bought, you know, right here. So you have the lenition of a certain uh, stop into semi-vowel, and then initial alveolar stops become your alveolar lateral, final alveolar stops become your um, alveolar outlet, right? And then this seems to be an attempt at replicating how the phonology of the native Chinese varieties of these servants interfere with the pronunciation of these terms. Now, as this class of individuals have since assimilated, um, these plays are some of the only depictions of how they may have navigated the linguistic space of the empire. Although, of course, there is a huge caveat here, as in any, you know, in any instance of I dialect, it should not be taken as a one-to-one -one reflection of how they used to speak, given that, of course, especially with these servant characters, they play comic characters and thus have their speech character uh, characteristics exaggerated with humorous effect. But what is still relevant and interesting is to the study is that this portrayal still lives on year after year. So this portrayal keeps on getting codified generation after generation. Now, I dialect is also used for some English words, bankruptcy instead of bankruptcy, to show the low proficiency of English, which older speakers had compared to younger ones. In general, this point is interesting because it seems um, relevant to investigate if the scripts reflect the situation of language shift that is ongoing in the community, which uh, uh, Dr. Nana Hui Yang Li did report, with younger Parangans using more and more English in favor of their native tongue. Now, however, the data shows that it's not merely a consistent increase of English over time, not that simple. So rather that the use of English neg negatively correlates with how much of the speech is uttered by vivid speakers. But this in itself could be hypothesized to be the script writer's attempt to indicate how there's a significant difference between the rates of English usage between the older and younger generations. So basically, the more bibic speech there is, the less English there is. However, what happens in Liu Safa, the play uh, basically that was put on in 2018, there's a relatively higher proportion of both English and bibic speech. And now this box a threat. So this indicates that you know there is some sort of like movement towards decreolization, right? Movement towards English still. Now, following this more social linguistic oriented test, I also wanted to look at how useful the corpus could be in illuminating like certain uh, changes that have happened to the vocabulary. Now, the first test was a simple calculation of each script's type to token ratio after excluding all uh, English speech. The type to token ratio is a blunt instrument which simply takes the number of to uh, total tokens and divided by the number of unique words, types, to measure lexical diversity. However, no statistically significant trend was actually established, though a more dedicated study could have been done in the future with more fine-grained measures, right, such as standardized type to token ratios, which do adjust for all sorts of other things, which may therefore give an accurate result. However, what can be done now is that this actually does obscure the fact that certain vocabulary items have seen significantly decreased usage. Another test I did was to isolate the words which did not appear in the Baba Malay Online Dictionary, a project I helped work on with some colleagues after we gained permission from the author to use his dictionary, the most updated one for Baba Malay. This was done using a simple program in Python. Now, of the top eight words that do not appear in the dictionary, six of them were featured in the scripts in the 80s, but have since disappeared from new word scripts. So this might suggest that some lexical loss is happening after all and also demonstrates the utility of a corpus in supplementing existing information with terms that are preserved only in old scripts but have fallen out of use and therefore might not be reported by lexicographers. Another utility that the corpus provides is that it allows for frequencies of different forms of the same lexical item to be tracked over time, as in the case of Fergie, to go, and its clip from feet. Clipping is a well-attributed process in Baba Malay, with many common standard Malay terms featuring a reduction in syllables. Another example would be the reduction of perfective aspect marker suda to swa. Now the trend here is quite evident. B sees a surge of use over Fergie after the 80s, and this might point toward a more overall trend of speakers attempting to distinguish their speech from standard Malay. There's much stronger evidence when we look at the endings of certain words, mainly those that end with certain alveolar consonants. A common sound change is that, that's found in the speech of certain individuals is the heightening of the vowel to air indicated orthographically like so, A-I-R, and the deletion of the final consonant. So I compared the rates of the form of the lexical word that most resembles standard Malay and that of the air ending versions. And the results were quite mixed. Although in some cases, 
the air version has become increasingly preferred as a basa to basa for market and denga to denga or to listen. But not all comparisons show a dramatic shift. But nevertheless, there is enough um, to suggest um, that there's increasing usage of the air form in script. And this can be attributed to how historically this is actually considered the more alus or refined pronunciation, which the community used to distinguish itself from other groups. It is essentially an in-group marker. And its increased use does mirror the increased use of B over Fergie as an attempt to codify and assert unique Baba Malay linguistic identities that basically resist that decriminalization. And finally, based on Dr. Nala's observations of certain syntactic structures, I ran some tests to see if certain observations about grammar still um, were proved uh, in earlier scripts as well. So the genitive in Baba Malay is formed, for example, um, through two ways. One is to reverse the standard word order and place basically the noun phrase after the pronoun, right? And the other is through the use of the genitive marker punya, where it's placed between the possessor and the possessor. So according to Dr. Nala's grammar, it, uh, the latter, where it basically used punya, is increasingly preferred, um, or rather it's increasingly preferred uh, form, uh, mia, which is also like an example of clipping, right? Which is evidence that clip forms are more popular nowadays. Um, yeah, that basically the use of the marker punya is the preferred word order. But the evidence suggests that this might not have always been the case, as the distribution of the two different synthetic constructions were quite equal up to a certain point until the 90s, at least in situations where the pronouns were basically involved as being the referent of the possessor. Finally, one more test was performed on passive constructors with our constructions of the marker gana. Now to do this, I had to separate basically um, um, gana as a lexical word and gana as a passive marker because there's two functions depending on what complement it takes. So basically it is just a passive structure marker if the complement is a verb phrase. And what I found out was that passive gana constructions seem to be more common in recent plates, which is quite interesting. Moreover, if you actually look at gana as a lexical marker, so gana actually means to contract. So you gana penyakit means you know to get a disease, right? Um, and it's interesting because of the fact that it seems that gana constructions are with English noun phrases are much more common now. In fact, they didn't really actually appear in the 80s. And this is very interesting because as code switching typically takes place at a clausal level, right? So this is not an example of code switching. Rather, it actually allows us to identify English loan words. So for example, when you have things like gonna find and gonna retrench, find and retrench are basically words that make their way into their Baba Malay lexicon as loan words in favor of you know, their standard Malay counterparts, which might have been once used. Now the future study is to also look at how these gonna constructions do they actually abide by criteria for um, gunner constructions in Malay that have actually been established by previous scholars, which I listed in the slide um, yeah, right at the last year. So two trends can possibly be established, right? We have two opposing forces right now. The newest scripts want to be updated. They want to you know, feel and look modern. So they want to reflect the process of language shift to English and the loss of the language transmission to younger individuals, right? But the newer scripts also feature more uniquely Baba Malay elements. And I think this is actually possibly an attempt for scriptwriters to reflect how the remaining speakers are guarding against the very force of decriminalization that I just spoke about. So, of course, the caveat is that more scripts need to be studied to confirm these trends. But I think you know, it's interesting how this study can actually show the utility um, of a conference to actually establish these general trends which are occurring in a language. Over time. And with that, Gamsia, thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, I hope like you have a great time in the rest of the party.